Hi, I'm Ted Haftegaber, founder and producer of Live Talks Los Angeles. Thanks for joining us. Since we started over a decade ago, we have brought you hundreds of conversations with storytellers, writers, actors, musicians, humorists, chefs, and thought leaders in business and science. You can watch and hear most of these in our YouTube channel and our podcast. For details, visit livetalksla.org. And now, Here's the show you've tuned in to see. We welcome Tana French to Live Talks Los Angeles, and we welcome back Jamie Lee Curtis. They'll discuss the writing life and Tana's novel, The Searcher. Tana is the author of seven previous books, including In the Woods, The Likeness, and The Witch Elm. The Searcher is her first novel to feature an American protagonist. Jamie Lee Curtis is an award-winning actress, and her credits include True Lies, Trading Places, A Fish Called Wanda, Freaky Friday, Halloween, Scream Queens, and Knives Out, among others. She's a philanthropist, and most recently, a podcaster. She loves books, and we appreciate her returning to Live Talks Los Angeles to talk to authors. They will talk, and I will pose some questions sent in from you in the audience. Take it from here, Jamie. Thank you so much. Okay, my twin from my my sister, my um, you know my I'm not going to call you my muse because that would be weird, but someone I admire so much and whose book completely um, thrilled, delighted, um, angered, uh, frustrated, and um, made me so happy to be reading it, which is the great pleasure of a book. And that I get to speak to you, Tana French, about it is really thrilling on this day. So welcome. Thank you. And thank you so much for doing this because you are somebody who I've admired on multiple levels as an artist and as a person since I was a teenager. So this means a huge amount to me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I, this is your first sort of American character, am I correct? So, yeah. so I'd like to just start with that as a as a as a question because you know, there's always in my world, there's always the the why now, the why now of a, a, an American uh, hero, if you will. Um, so, can you talk a little bit about that, please? That came out of the fact that I've been reading a lot of westerns. Um, I was recommended Lonesome Dove and found the genre really, really interesting. A lot of its tropes and I found that they had a lot of resonances with the, the west of Ireland. Partly it was the setting, it's the, you know, this harsh terrain that demands real toughness, both mental and physical, out of anyone who wants to make a living from it. And this sense also that the people who live there feel so distant from the centers of power, like geographically, but also, also culturally. And that if they want a cohesive society, they feel that they have to make their own rules and then enforce them. So I started thinking, well, how would some of those tropes of the Western translate to the West of Ireland? And the one that I kept coming back to was the outsider. Mm -hmm. You know how the, the outsider rolls into town and he shows up in the saloon and he's got a few secrets of his own, he's not telling, but you know, he's going to be a catalyst. He's going to change things. Maybe, you know, the, the, he'll shoot the corrupt sheriff and set the town to rights, or maybe he's going to get shot for trying to expose secrets, or maybe he'll you know, shoot the hero and break the heroine's heart, but he's going to change things. He's going to shake up the established order. And the idea of the outsider coming into the small rural town, it's very much a thing in Irish drama as well, like Playboy of the Western World, for example, it's, or The Field are two of the great Irish plays. And in both of them, the outsider coming into town disturbs the established order in ways that have huge ramifications, seismic ramifications. And if he was going to be an outsider, he couldn't be Irish because this is a really small country and the national game is find the connection. 
Like you meet somebody and they're trying to find out, hang on, did my cousin go to school with your sister maybe? Or did I go out with somebody who's your neighbor now? And if he was Irish, even if he was from across the country and had never been to this village, he'd walk in there and he would have some connection. His dad would have played poker with a guy from there. He worked with somebody who was married to someone from there. And within an hour, uh, Noreen, the like shopkeeper and information repository, she would have spotted the connection and that would have placed him within the town's framework. He would have had a place within the narrative and within the network of relationships. And then he wouldn't have been the outsider anymore. He wouldn't have had that power to disrupt. So he had to be from another country. Like he couldn't even be from Boston or New York, or he would have known someone who knew someone from this. Sure, place. sure, sure. And so then- yeah. I, you know, the outsider, we're all so uh, wary, interested, wondering. It's such a wonderful device to bring someone from the United States and, you know, plopping them in this old house, in this village, in this, in this community of, as you said, people who everyone knows their pecking order, every, excuse the pun, but you know, seriously, it's, it's, there's a hierarchical setting of family, of neighbors, and it was extraordinary to plop this person, as you said, couldn't be from Boston or New York because there would have been a connection, but Chicago, Yeah, I figured it needed to be a big city because he needed to be a guy who had been somewhere rural before. So even though he doesn't speak the language here, he doesn't know any of the codes. He is aware that there are codes in place, but he couldn't have been living in a small town up until then because this needed to be in some ways something that he thought would be a return to a setting that he understood. And then he has, of course, he finds out differently. He finds out that the codes here are ones he doesn't understand at all. The silences here are in places that he doesn't know about. He knows that there will be silences, but he doesn't know where and why and how ferociously imposed they are. Because Ireland, I have to say, is very good at imposing silence. When something is shouldn't be said, when we don't want something to be happening, we're very, very good at imposing silence. Like, so the, the, the example that's very much in my mind right now is um, in the schools. The Department of Health has not, done, not only shut down all contact tracing and testing, but they've told schools not to tell parents about any COVID cases in the school because it's this idea that if you silence things, they don't count, they're not happening. And I think Cal is used to a slightly different form of silence. And when he arrives here and starts to realize, realize that the silence is a weapon and something that's being used to make things not exist. Then he finds himself in a place where he's going, do I peel it back? Do I not peel it back? What am I unleashing? So he had to be coming from enough of a big city that he Mm -hmm. could have forgotten Mm -hmm. what that was like. Mm -hmm. Wow, you said peeling it back. It made me think of peeling an onion. And to me, this book is like peeling an onion. It, it, It just every character, you start to peel away what you think about them, and then what you learn about them, which is the beauty of, in, I'm in recovery for a long time. And that's what we talk about as we start to get to know ourselves. You complimented me at the beginning of this and I joked with you off camera that it's taken me a long time and I still am just figuring it out. That's the peeling of the onion, the layers of all of that protection that we, that we put around ourselves before we can ever expose who we are. And the other phrase that I love is that you're only as sick as your secrets. And there are a lot of secrets in our, in this community that he lands in. Oh yeah. There are a lot of secrets and it's not what he was expecting because he's got to the point where he feels that morally his life has become more complicated than he can cope with both professionally and personally, he's always had a belief that morals are fairly simple. There's good and there's bad, and you just try to treat everybody right and get stuff done, you're basically okay. And he's realized that it's not as simple as that, and that he has in some way become things that he doesn't want to be. He has become something that he cannot consider moral in many ways. And he feels like if he gets somewhere small and rural, it'll all be simple again, somewhere far Mm -hmm. from the place where he was a husband, a father, a cop, it'll be simple. 
And I think when we go somewhere new, there always is that illusion of simplicity before, as you say, we start peeling back the layers of the onion. It looks like such a simple, nice, easy to understand thing. And then as you start peeling it back, he does realize that this simplicity is very illusory and that everybody as an individual is much more complex, but that the place itself is much more complex than he initially thought. And that is the case for everybody in every place. Um, in recovery, we call it pulling a geographic when you move a distance to somehow be the new, to yeah. be like where it's all fine and you're fine, but of course that's not the case and you're not fine and nothing really has changed except you've moved place. Why did he go? I yeah. don't know. I, you know what? I'm gonna I'm that. gonna hook you up with all of the recovery slogans because yeah. they're so appropriate for people with secrets, people mm -hmm. with shame, and of course, a lot of these people in this town have a lot of shame and secrets. So, what do you think happened? To, why do you think he went there? I mean, you know, but I, like, yeah. I, it's not clear. So, can you tell me why he went there? Well, I, I do think it's very much a moral issue. And this kind of ties into the Western thing mm -hmm. that I was saying before, that one of the things I liked about Westerns is they deal really matter-of-factly with the complexity of morality. And I think like a lot of people, I've been thinking a lot about that recently. And it seems to me that there's always a tendency to try and make it simple, to try and make it, there's that word again, to try and make it black and white, to go, okay, this person liked a really vile tweet on Twitter, so they're evil, end of story. Mm -hmm. Or, well, this person routinely does terrible things to people, but they say they're religious, so they're a good person, end of story. And no further thought needed. Of course, it's never that simple. People are always, always complicated. But Westerns are quite good at being matter of fact about the fact that good people can do bad things and vice versa, and that there are some situations where there is no good solution, and that people of all, of all kinds can find it really difficult to deal with that. And Westerns don't try to gloss that over. They don't try to back away from the complexity and they don't try to resolve it. They just lay it out and you deal with it. And so once I started writing this book, I knew it's going to have to engage somewhere with this kind of intractable complexity of morality. And I was interested in the idea that Cal didn't want to engage with that intractable complexity. And he was fleeing from it, hoping he'd find sanctuary, hoping he'd reconnect with simplicity. And Ireland, I think, has always been somewhere that people have a perception of it as much simpler and more, not necessarily bucolic, but much simpler than it is and much, um, much easier to deal with on a cultural or moral level. But, and it is a very welcoming and very lovely place, but like everywhere else, it has complexities. But I think the image that's portrayed is one that's quite simple and straightforward. And I'd say that's why he gravitated towards it. It's not really dealt with in the book, but I'd say that's what he saw. He saw like these happy looking people on the tourist websites and these beautiful, beautiful landscapes and everything looking simple and went for that. Do you think it's, <sighs> the other, <laughs> recovery phrase that popped in my head just now is nothing changes unless something changes. And mm -hmm. in a small town where there are a lot of secrets, nothing changes. Uh, mm -hmm. There is that quotidian daily grind. I have spent quite a bit of time in the Wicklow Mountains oh, um, wow. in yeah. Animo with my friend John Borman and his family. And I have spent time in Animo with the local people that John knew. And I have felt that beautiful community of the Irish um, uh, family unit of neighbors and friends. And I have been a, a, you know, a privileged guest to many of that. And yet at the same time, like everywhere, there is also, um, there is a, not even a frisson of secrets, but there are secrets. And do you think 
so the catalyst is, of course, Cal Cumming. Do you think those secrets, do you think any of those people would have, nobody would do anything? It, it demands somebody to come in and say nothing changes unless something changes. And what I love in the book is that he doesn't want to. He's at first just like, I'm just going to do this. I'm just going to deal with this house. I don't want to make it. I just want to kind of grow old and be happy here. I'm, I'm just trying to be a part of the community. And he is, he is pushed in his relationship with Trey to do the thing he doesn't want to do, which is Eleanor Roosevelt's, you know, great um, entreaty to people is do the thing you think you cannot do. Yeah. I think it's another Western trope though, is that the journey is never what you think it is. Mm -hmm. You know, you go searching for one thing. Cal thinks he's searching for peace and quiet. And then somebody crashes into your journey. You encounter a stranger on the road. And it turns out that what you're searching for isn't what you thought. And that this stranger, by accident, may be the point of your journey. Things change. And the journey shapes itself rather than you really having the, the control or power to shape it. But I think you're right. No, no nothing would have changed otherwise. Mm -hmm. Because... I think people in small communities are very, very aware and very sensitive to the amount of effect they have on each other. Like I live in a city and if you want to have no impact on your neighbors, which is kind of what Cal wants at the beginning of this book, mm -hmm. it's fairly easy. Just don't have loud parties and don't get a dog that barks too much. Mm -hmm. You're kind of good. You, you can have not much impact on your neighbors. But in a, in a small community, a small interconnected community, your decisions have a real impact on other people. There's a bit in the book where we're Lena points out to Cal that when uh, women started being able to get better jobs, loads of young girls and young women left the town. And that means that there's a load of guys who are growing old with nobody to marry. And that's changing the entire tenor of the townland. That's changing the atmosphere. So what seems like a personal decision, you know, I'm going to move to Dublin and get a good job. That turns out to have a ripple effect throughout the community. And I think people are very aware of that. And so are quite possibly more reluctant to start something that might have effects that they can't gauge? Um, because the whole book is about uh, circumstances that have this now ripple effect um, mm -hmm. with, with um, this, this. So the question I have just for us as, as the, in this conversation, so, do we have to assume that people have read the book? <laughs> because I want to be able to talk about yeah. aspects of it, but do I have to say spoiler alert every time? It's that tricky, we can't, it's a mystery. It's so beautifully woven and it just, you just, they're beautiful turns and twists, but I'm assuming that people are watching this, having, or listening to this, having read the book, who want to hear you talk about your process of, of the storytelling rather than me try to kind of squeeze in questions that have no relevance to the spoiler alerts in the book. And there are a bunch of them. So I'm going to, I'm just going to like, I'm just, so if, if you're here with us, I'm going to start to talk about some stuff that happened in the book that were thrilling and exciting to me. Um, at the same time, it may now ruin the book for you. Um, I, I see a therapist and whenever I talk about books, I'm always like, can I tell you about this? I don't want to ruin the book. I don't want to ruin whatever it is that I'm telling you. And she says, you know, Miss Curtis, people have ruined books and movies for me my entire career. It's OK, <laughs> because, you know, you don't you want you when I give this book as a gift to people. I, I'm, I'm giving it saying there is a delicious stew of storytelling and time and place and verisimilitude and character and conflict and this and that. And I'm not going to tell you anything. I'm just going to give you the gift of the stew and you're going to be delighted and call me later and go, oh my fucking God, are you <laughs> kidding? Like, are you kidding? Um, and so... You know, but I can't really talk about it without. Um, so I wanted to literally I'm going to ask you a couple process questions just because I'm I interviewed uh, Marisha Pessel once uh, and uh, 
you know, I wanted to know her process. And she has this very rigid process where she writes, okay, let me see that one now. Because she had, I was surprised. She had a very rigid process of four hours, take a break, four hours, don't get up, don't look at your phone, don't do anything. Even if you're not making work, just be where you are in the, in the mind space of the characters. What is your process, ma'am? Like how, oh, well, I'm interested. It's disorganized. It's disorganized. I'm, I mean, time-wise, it's not disorganized. I'll tell you what has really sharpened my sense of time and maybe a little more focused is I have kids who are in school for a certain number of hours a day and that is my work time. And it's amazing how much more you can get done when you know the clock is ticking towards, uh-oh, school run time, they're gonna be home, they're gonna want snack. So when, before I had them, I had a tendency to write until like three in the morning and then sleep till 10, which I loved, it was great, but it was easy to space out and not get as much done because you could always stay up till four if you wanted. Whereas now, nope, that clock is ticking. But in terms of, of like having an outline and things like that, I don't, I don't do that. I'm in awe and envy of authors who have this outline and they know what every chapter is going to hold because they know there's going to be a book there at the end. They know that all the loose ends will in fact tie up. They know what they're doing. But I can't work that way. I go in, I've got a really clear sense of the main character. I've got a basic premise and I've got a really clear sense of the main location. And apart from that, I have no idea. I don't know who done it. I don't know why. Because I acted for years and that's what I trained as. And I think I still write like an actor where you have to know the character first in order to understand what they do and why. And I have to write them for a while before I know who would do what to whom and what their motives would be. So what happens is I get to about chapter seven and I go, oh God, that person totally did this. And then I have to go back and write, rewrite chapters one through three in the light of this new knowledge, which is an absolute pain in the ass. But on the other hand, it means that I'm having surprises and revelations as I write. And I'm hoping that some of that will translate to the audience and so they'll feel that same sense of, oh, wow, of course, but wow, I didn't see that coming. Mm -hmm. I hope that some of it seeps through. Oh, I guarantee you it seeps through. Are you kidding? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the beneficiary of the seeping um, and the, oh, no, oh, and then going back and looking. Um, I also, okay, that's fascinating to me. I also understand as the mother of two, how the school schedule time becomes the, you know, uh, and I believe at the time, I don't know if that's the case now, Miss Pessel also didn't have children. So she, it was her methodology. Um, I write books for children, but I literally don't think about them until they enter my head. And then it all comes out in a flow when I'm least expecting it. I can be somewhere else and I lay down on the floor and it comes to me and I write it out and then I go like, oh, okay, wow. Okay, that's a book, okay. And then I get on with my day. Um, I also love the um, setting of this is this old house. Now I have been in Ireland many, many times. I have stayed in many old houses and there is such history in the dwellings in Ireland, if those walls could talk. And this, I know that there are houses in other um, uh, books of yours that sort of centralize the story, but this feels like the house is a character in, in the book in a very big way. And I just thought it'd be helpful to have you talk a little bit about why that house, what you, th you know what I mean? And talk about something inanimate like a house and how it can breathe such life into, um, you know, into the, into the storytelling. Well, thank you. Cause I think it's probably pretty obvious that I, I, I love houses. I love old houses in particular, the older the better, but houses in general. And I blame it on, on having grown up traveling. Like we, we never owned a house. I'm the first person in my family to have actually bought a house because we were moving every few years. And it gave me a real craving for a house that was my own and my home and 
that I could stay put in, where I could put down roots. But I think the other thing it did was, if you're constantly moving, you associate different periods in your life, different sets of memories, very strongly and deeply with different places. The idea of, of memory and place being intertwined becomes very strong because when you leave a phase of your life behind, you leave a place at the same time and then you do it again a few years later. So there's this very strong link between place and personal memory. And I think I brought that to everything I've written where places are to me very highly charged with memory and personal experience and, and uh, emotion, strong emotion and passion are, are very deeply rooted in place. And for Cal, he's coming to a place where he has no memories. He, and it's broken down, it's this old cottage, nothing particularly great about it, it's not gorgeous or anything, it's just one of these cottages that you do get down the country where for whatever set of reasons, the family who owned it has moved away, died, there's nobody, nobody left who's looking after it. And it's started slowly to disintegrate. And he comes to this at a point where he wants to, he wants to repair, he's a fixer. He likes fixing things and he likes doing things in concrete ways. And to him, this house is something concrete that he can fix when he can't fix, he feels he can't fix himself or his life. So he's got something concrete here that he can fix. But of course, that is a highly emotionally charged thing. When you pour all that emotion and all that sense of damage and all that sense that he has of being off track and having lost hold of himself and what he wants his life to be and what he wants his, his moral self to be. When all of that gets poured into this place that he's trying to mend and fix up, it becomes a powerful thing. So to him, this house is a very powerful and deeply charged thing that he's working on throughout the book. And little by little, it starts to come together, but he's got input from a source he didn't expect, which again is what we were saying earlier, that the journey never goes quite how you planned it. Yeah, I don't think he thought the tray would show up. I'm mm -hmm. just, just talking a little bit more about the house. I when you just said about being on track, the, the drawer in the desk and the attention to trying to figure out what's wrong with it and then teaching Trey what you do to put something back on track yeah. because that's what was missing was the track for the drawer so it couldn't slide in and then the waxing of it and the massaging of it. I thought it was just such a beautiful thing because you focus on it pretty intensely as a writer, that desk. Because again, it's this discarded desk that has no story and yet he's trying to give it that same repair and story to be able to be and it becomes part of the story in this teaching moment between him and this teenager who shows up. I just, I loved the drawer. I, it made me, I'm a bit of a MacGyver. Uh, I don't even know if you know what that reference is. It was a TV show of a guy who like, I think fashion, I don't even know what the reference is to be perfectly honest. I'm a lying bitch. I, <laughs> I, I use the term MacGyvering daily. And yet I don't really know. I think he was a kind of a, guy who I don't even know I'd have to google it but I turned my phone off um but okay but whatever I I do I I fashion myself someone there's something we have in this country called Gugon and also we have something called WD40 which mm -hmm. is a lubricant which which is something you uh, spray on hinges and latches and things that squeak and need a little lubricant, a little, then there's also something very sexual and beautiful about just trying to create something. It, to me, it was very hopeful. It was a sign of his maybe beginning feeling like a man where he might be a man again, you know, because he's had a failed relationship. It's resulted in a child. He has now left not only that home, those people, but he's gone across the pond. Yeah. yeah. So I just, and I love the desk. 
But thank you. I like that idea. And I liked also the idea of, and I think there's something very powerful about the idea of teaching, passing on a skill and a concrete skill. And it's something that it seems to be quite rare and quite valuable because nobody has a lot of time to do concrete things or to teach concrete things. So for him, it is a powerful thing in terms of yeah, himself as a man, but also in terms of himself as a not a father in this case, but almost a surrogate father. Oh, a surrogate a to a kid who needs someone to teach them how to be an adult. And he's passing on the skills of how to mend things, how to fix things, how to give things care and time and skill. And that's a big thing, I think. That, that's a very powerful thing. So the, yeah, that drawer has a little bit of that going on. Yeah, and you know, this inclusion of this young child, that shows up. So it's such an unexpected, um, very Western themed yeah. um, alliance between need. He is lonely. He has all this information and skill. This kid is coming to him for a different reason. The kid is mm -hmm. coming to him for a reason. We don't know that. And yet, the way into that relationship is old school teaching. You know, we in our country, we have something called Big Brothers and Big Sisters, which is a program which literally you sign up to offer um, your ability as an older person to become a big brother to a child who doesn't have a sibling, whose father may be um, dead or incarcerated or or not in the picture and you as a big brother can advocate for them teach them help them learn and or a big sister same thing you can become that surrogate and so i i think it's beautiful that you you like do you remember the moment you were like oh i'm gonna have this kid show up i'm just curious <laughs> Yeah, that was actually the, one of the very first things that I knew about the book was that I wanted it to be the, the relationship between this outsider and this young kid who showed up needing something from him. It's a Western trope. It's another Western trope, kind of the retired gunslinger. Yeah. And the kid who in some way is lost or searching for something or uh, at odds with family or community and needs something from the old retired gunslinger. And usually, again, it's not what they think they need. What they need, Cal thinks what he needs is to be left alone. And the only way he can get that is by investigating the disappearance of Trey's brother, because Trey's not gonna leave him alone until he does that. And Trey thinks, well, what I need is to find out what happened to my brother, but that turns out not to be what's really needed here. Right, and course. they only discover that together along the way. Right. and. You know, Trey not, Trey wants him, he, he, as you said from the, at the beginning of the conversation, Trey's not going to learn what happened to his brother within the community. Yeah. That, 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 that is not going to happen. And that's going to haunt Trey for the rest of Trey's life. Yeah. Uh, and so when you hear that an ex-cop has moved into the cottage up the hill. We don't know that that's why Trey is coming there. We, 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 and as you said, the beauty is that the relationship that is formed between them, um, in a way, the relationship he wasn't able to form with his own daughter feels redemptive and exquisite in the way that you weave the need for both of them, as much as he wants to be left alone, he doesn't want to be left alone. <laughs> we, you know, like, um, and as much as Trey wants him to find out what happened to his brother or her brother, which we're going to talk about now, um, uh, Trey is also needing contact in a way that Trey is not going to get and maybe had with Brendan and is now lost without it. Um, yeah. So um, I, I, I think that, you know, that relationship, uh, the way you weave that relationship is so, it, 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 and it's a really unexpected love story. And I say love 
in many ways. I, it's an unexpected love story with Lena, although you hope, like you got to have hope. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I've read books that have just gutted me. Um, um, there's a, a book called A Fine Balance. And it's so brutal what happens in this book. It's just gutting and like, throwing you down on the floor in sobs. And I still like to read a book that gives me some hope for love, uh, healing, um, complexity in relationships, but that maybe in the end, love will, will happen. Like I, I, I'm old fashioned um, I'm in that way. And so I was hoping for that, but I do think that there's, there's this beautiful love also between Trey and Cal that uh, you've already uh, talked about, but it, it, it was unexpected to me of how moved I was by their relationship. Um, so it's so interesting. I, I'm sure, or I'm sure, why would I be sure about anything? It's 2021. We're not sure about anything. <laughs> there is no guarantee. There is no plan. Um, I recently talked about the fact that my youngest child is trans and, um, is now, um, Ruby. And so pronouns have become very important to me. Um, I mind my pronouns pretty carefully. I've slowed my speech down because I want to make sure that I am not using the incorrect pronoun out of repetition of rote. It's so interesting because the simple use of the term he you the assumptions made to the he are there's no question there's not a hint there's no and then when we find out the tray is in fact a girl it changes everything because we've ascribed so much to the he the he of it. It's a boy and his older brother. Yes. It's a exactly. mother and her son. Mm -hmm. It's a father who's abandoned a son. Um, it, 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 Cal brings it up that Cal has invited a boy into his house, but if he had known it was a girl, that would have changed. So I just, I would love to know how and when that came to you how you like did that surprise you and then go oi uh, please tell yes. us one thing was very early on i knew okay everybody in this townland has to not in some way not be what cal thinks they are i was going this kid can't be deliberately fooling him or putting him on that's not what the relationship's like that's not what the relationship's all about and i was thinking what well there's some fundamental assumption that Cal must be making about this kid, that based on no particular communication between them, Cal's just making the wrong assumption. Cal is basing everything on an assumption that's wrong. And when that's whipped out from under him, what's he gonna do about it? How's he gonna reevaluate? And I also found that when I was thinking about who the kid would be, I was never completely sure in my head whether this should be a boy or a girl. And then I went, well, that, that's probably where the where the uncertainty and the, the, the lack of clarity is, is probably somewhere around the kid's gender. Well, okay, so what if Cal thinks he's dealing with a boy and then only finds out later that this relationship, which he's based on the assumption of he, is in fact with her. And one of the things that I found kind of fun to write was that Cal is, as you say, initially he's horrified. He's like, I would not have been inviting a 13 year old girl into my house anytime, no. But then gradually he realizes that the relationship hasn't been as defined by gender as he thought. It's actually been defined much more by the individuals and doesn't need to shift as much as he initially thought. It can continue pretty much the way it was because they are still pretty much who they've always been. And to him, I think in this, 
odd makeshift relationship that they've patched together out of strange bits and pieces that they happen to have available within their natures. It's nice to know, I think it means a lot to him to know that it doesn't have to change because he made one mistake early on, that they can just shift, their, he can just shift his perception a little bit and keep on going because Trey is still the same kid. Yes, but then there's that wonderful moment when Trey has been injured and he sends Lena in to, yes. to because he yeah. doesn't feel that yeah. that that she's going to need an examination somehow to determine other injuries, and that is this because he's also raised a girl. There yes. are those sense memories that come from raising a girl, where there's certain things a dad doesn't do, that there are those forbidden aspects. And um, it was so sweet to see him um, um, feel that um, need to protect her in that way. It was so sweet. It's so such a beautiful his way. Say again? He's feeling his way, you know, in, in a situation where he feels like, he probably didn't do the best job with his own daughter dearly as he loves her. And he's kind of feeling his way on doing, uh, trying to be decent to this kid who isn't even his daughter, but who he really, really doesn't want to mess up in any way. So he's, he's just trying to figure it out as he goes. I also, of course, just in the teaching aspect, there's so many areas in the book where, where he is teaching Trey Right. And the gun, the whole idea of um, um, the whole, the beautiful control there is about owning a firearm, applying for it in this country is, yeah. you know, you can go to Walmart and get a gun. Whereas, it, you know, it, yeah. that, that here he is an ex-police officer who's going through the, the small town bureaucracies of making the application, getting the approval, getting the license, buying the firearm, and then teaching Trey how to use the firearm, which then comes into when the threat comes in. Um, I have so much I want to talk to you about. Um, the threat, let's just talk about the threat for a minute. So what I love is that it's, in the end, it, it's just low level, poorly raised, um, greedy, bad people, um, hurt people who hurt people who hurt people. That it's not, that it's, it, it, there's an accidental aspect to it, even though there are nefarious people doing, you know, hurting people who hurt people who hurt. It's all, it's all very human. It, oh, good. It, 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 but it didn't go beyond that. You know, it could have, it could have, do you know what I mean? Like it just yeah. stayed very much contained. And yet this entire book, draws you into that conclusion. It's not the the book, which is 452 pages, 51. And it's my shortest book yet. <laughs> okay, right. well that's, but it's 451 pages. And yet it's m so much more of a love story and a character story. Um, for me, uh, and a time and place story than it is the mystery. The mystery is interesting and draws you in and allows you to follow the trail. But um, I don't know, I, I, I loved this book so, uh, as you know, I, I had a very strong reaction to the book. Um, let's talk about the code. I'd like to talk a little bit about the code about police officers, about violence. And I did mark one page because there are a couple places, forgive me, I'm not a very good host, um, 
but there are two places. Forgive me, everyone. Check your watch. Don't check your email. <laughs> um, um, by the way, your description, uh, your, your, your use of words uh, has delighted me for many years, but what really delighted me, I don't know why I snort laughed at mule-tempered internet. <laughs> I I, I've, I've, we've all, there's not a person here who hasn't dealt with it. And yet there's never been a description better than mule-tempered <laughs> internet. So you can go all you want, but it doesn't care. No, it's 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 exactly it doesn't care. So here's here are these two themes that are not, you know, they're not a klaxon horn or there's not a big cowbell ringing. It's a it's a but it's a note. It's a musical note throughout the piece. You talk about. Um, policeman and um you know why he retired and um trey says uh, cal says black people got mad about being treated like crap bad cops got mad because they were getting called on their shit all of a sudden good cops got mad because they were the bad guys when they hadn't done anything and then later um you say Um, Cal has met this guy before in various forms. He's out of the boondocks, not because he's a daughter or a troublemaker or a wannabe detective chafing with frustrated ambition, but because he's happy here. He likes his days unhurried and unsurprising. His, familiar, his face is familiar and his mind unclouded when he goes home to his wife and kids. This is, he's talking about someone, the cop in town. He's the cop who Cal in some way or possibly most ways wishes he had decided to be, which was to not get involved. So I just, I want to talk just a little bit about the cop code and about that, that statement of why he retired. Because in those three sentences, I think you encapsulated why this country is in the mess it's in. I think it, this was a hard one to write because there's a different relationship between the police and the public here. There's a, the entire idea of the police and racism are differently woven together. I'm not saying we're any better, I'm saying it's different. You know, just on the most obvious level, uh, our police, uh, the, the standard ones who you'd see on the street don't have guns, they, they don't carry guns. No. So it's just an entirely different process encountering a policeman here, it's a, a guard they're called, or a guard. It's just an entirely different thing, you're not, no matter who you are, you're not at any level wondering if you're going to get shot because he said he doesn't have a gun. It's different if, if they're, you know, some special gun or anything, but just if somebody stops you for a ticket, he doesn't have a gun. So it's just an entirely different relationship, an entirely different underlying thing. But it was a hard one to write because I knew I didn't fully understand the US, the, the, just the, the US police force, the US code, the US relationship with, with police men and police women. I did a lot of reading. I read every forum I could find that had anything to do with this. But again, you're never fully going to understand it. So I was, I was quite careful not to go into too much depth. But one thing I did have Cal realizing was, although he simplifies it to Trey there at the beginning, where he says, you know, these people are mad for this reason, these people are mad for this reason, these people are mad for this reason. When it comes to him talking about the shooting, not, not that he didn't shoot anybody, but his partner shot at somebody and missed, that leads in the long run to Cal retiring. There, the line is something like, I'm gonna forget my own line now, but something like um, he had realized that one or the other of them or both, him or the job couldn't be trusted. And he has realized that there's some deep fundamental flaw, either in his job or in his response to it, in what it has made of him or in all of those and something is flawed straight through. And for him anyway, it is impossible to be both a policeman and what he would consider to be a good man. And he's not sure where the flaw lies, but he can't do it anymore. And that's what's led to his retirement. And that was one thing that I got very much from reading is that there's a flaw running straight through that makes it 
very morally complex being a policeman or policewoman in America for anybody involved. It's intrinsically morally complex. And more so now yeah. than ever, of course. Um, you can't go what Cal's, you can't do what, what Cal's instinct is, was, which is to just go, well, if I treat everybody decently and get stuff done, then I'm automatically on the side of good. And he's a guy who wants to fix things. And that's one reason why he went into the police. You know, you, you can fix things that way. And it's come to him that it's not that simple. No matter how hard he tries to make it, he can't make it that simple. So I want to talk about before I have before I have to take questions, which I don't want to do. Um, I mean, I will, because that's my job. Um, <laughs> I want to talk about the love story. I want to talk about Lena. Um, I I am rooting for them so bad. I'm rooting for them so hard. I want. I want them to wake up with that little puppy between that, not little, you know what I mean? Like I, I was so happy that there is a genuine feeling. I don't care who's read the book or, and will disagree with me. I believe they will end up together. I believe it to my core. <laughs> and I, I'm, I, I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about that. But I liked writing that relationship. I really liked writing that relationship because it's not um, a particularly smooth or easy one. And neither one of them is looking for any kind of relationship at all. And of course, Lena's sister is desperately trying to matchmake them, which puts Lena's back up instantly. They've got no intent. But somehow they find themselves moving into the roles of the man and wife in some odd makeshift cobbled together family that has just sort of happened. And within this book, they don't end up taking the step of ending up in an actual relationship. But I am, much to my own surprise, writing a sequel, apparently. So in that, it becomes very clear whether they do end up together or not. I can't. I can't. <laughs> I'm feeling too. I can't. I can't. Oh no, I've probably now poisoned it because I've just said, of course, they're going to end up together. Oh, and that was just my fantasy that I was just so excited for them. Oh no, no, maybe they don't. Now it's going to break my heart. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you are camera, but I'm not spoiling it for anybody else. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wanted that. I wanted the like them waking up with that puppy in between them and the puppy licking their faces. It's <laughs> calming. I, I'm telling you, I'm an old fashioned romantic. Oh, that would just rip my guts out. Oh my goodness. Oh, okay. Look, I flush. Look at this. And I don't look at this. I don't flush. I don't get embarrassed. I am, I'm flushing like a, like a, like a, like a teenage girl imagining now my dream has been shattered. Um, what is that game that the teenage girls play where like love, marry, whatever. There's some game where you categorize people. I'm forgetting. Oh, yeah. Not, yeah, whatever. It's a stupid game, but look at me. I'm flush. I'm literally, I'm, I'm, ha well, maybe I'm having a flush. <laughs> a whole other um, book and conversation. Um, just one last question for me, which is a kind of nerdy. Um, uh, uh, um, if I'm not mistaken, and I may have gotten this information because I checked uh, from your publishers, that it's the first time you've written in the third person. Why? Tell me like how that happened. Okay, I had just finished writing The Witch Elm before this, and The Witch Elm was an incredibly introspective book where, you know, because the main premise is that the protagonist has been hit on the head during a burglary and he has an acquired brain injury and his head is basically a foreign country to him in a very scary, scary place. And so much of the real action of the book is in the inside of his head. This is the site of much of the struggle of the book. So it's a very interior focus, very first person, like, you needed to be in order to, to mm -hmm. you know, get the action. Look, you need to be inside the main character's head. 
And by the end of it, I was so tired of introspection. I was so tired of a main character who was all up in his head. Just by the end of the book, I was going, oh, stop it. I enjoyed most of the writing, but the last week or two, I was just going, oh my God, get a grip, you don't do something. So for the next book, I knew that I wanted to write about somebody who was much more about action than about thought, who, was much, who thought it was much more interesting what you do and well, rather than what you say or think. And that's Cal. Cal doesn't think it really matters what you think, what you say, what you feel about issues. What defines you is what you do about them. What are you actually doing in action? He's a man of action, which fits with the Western thing again. And so for that, I kind of needed the third person because first person implies that you need to be within the character's head to understand. Whereas for Cal, that wouldn't matter. Cal would be like, no, you don't need to see what's inside my head. Who cares? You need to see what I do. And so third person made more sense where rather than being in the character's head, you're at their shoulder. So hence third person, it was kind of a function of the character and of me not wanting to do any more introspection. And it's interesting because I am an action girl. I'm an action girl. I'm a complete action girl. I, I believe that actions speak way louder than words. Um, I am not an intellectual um, I am, I am, I'm fairly uneducated for a articulate human being. I'm really very uh, uh, poorly educated. And so for me, everything is action. What you do matters. Um, how you leave a, a, in what, wherever you are by your deeds is what people will remember, not the jawing of an intellectual pursuit or an idea, which of course there are, uh, there is plenty of room for in the universe and we're desperate for it. Um, but uh, it is, it is something that I, I think I was so drawn. I, maybe I'm secretly in love with Cal. I was about to say you get on really well with Cal. <laughs> maybe I just understand. wish that. But don't tell my husband that I've <laughs> fallen in love with a fictional character. From one of the <laughs> it's a perfect rival. If you know my husband, please do not text him now and say, hmm, you know, Jamie may be like having a little bit of a thing with a guy named Cal. Um, okay, everyone. All right, so now um, audience questions. Ted, Terrific. what are they? Thank you. We have uh, a few process-related questions, so I'll uh -huh. start, start with those. Uh, do you know how your books will end when you begin them? And when you begin them, do you, do you know all the characters or do new characters get introduced along the way? Th that's a really good question because I think authors have such a huge range of answers to that. I'm firmly on the side of not knowing what I'm doing. I never know what I'm doing. I know the main character and this one, I have kind of a strong sense of Trey, but other people kind of pop up as the book requires them. And then you realize along the way that further down the line, that, oh my God, I actually have a really serious use for this character. Like you throw in somebody, I mean, I threw in Cal's neighbor, Mart, mainly because I felt he needed a good connection to the townland, somebody who could tell him what was going on and somebody who would lighten the tone a little bit. And then about two thirds of the way through the book went, oh man, this guy's gonna turn out to be important. I actually needed this guy. Mm -hmm. So I think your subconscious is doing stuff along the way where you think you're just doing something because we well, you know what the hell could do with somebody like this but your subconscious is seeding stuff for later on. And no, I have no idea who done it. I don't have a clue. I think I was, yeah, roughly half two thirds of the way through with this one when I figured it out about there. That's kind of average for me. Although I think there's been one where I was at least three quarters of the way in. Makes for a lot of rewriting. Wow, so interesting. Great question, audience yeah. member. Can you talk a little bit more about place, location, and your stories? Does the location come first, or do you conveniently create the location that suits the storyline you want to take your characters through? Uh, the location is, like I was saying earlier on, it's one of the kind of three core things that I usually have in place before I ever start the book. One of the very few things where I actually know what I'm doing is on location. And my location's kind of tend to be a combination of real place and made up. 
mm-hmm. where I don't want to be too tied down to a real place because then, you know, both geographically and culturally, you're stuck with what you've got and that might not be what the book requires. But I like kind of the idea of it, the basis of it to be rooted to it some extent in reality. And I love the West of Ireland. I always have since I was a teenager and used to go there for summers. I've adored the West of Ireland. And so this is rooted there, but it's not a specific real place. It's more somewhere that has notes of real places that I've been, but has a shape that's grown up around the book. So it's kind of a balance between real and not real. There, there is nowhere where people have done, as far as I know, the things that get done in this book, I promise. Uh, have you considered a book with a female as the main protagonist? Yeah, I've written, well, I suppose you could say two and a half so far with a female as the main protagonist. The Likeness and The Trespasser both have female narrators and main characters, and The Secret Place sort of switches back and forth. It's half from the perspective of a male detective and half from the shared perspective of four teenage girls. So I've written two and a half with female characters. I like... um, I like characters who are far from me, which I think is one reason why I've written a lot of male narrators. That's I mean, that's the fun of it. I'm me all day. When I'm writing, I want to be somebody else and see what it's like to see the world through someone else's eyes. So I do a lot of all characters who are very different from me. And a lot of the time that ends up being guys. Next question says, I'd like to know more about how you research, especially all the details around police work. God, I know a lot of very weird things. When I was doing Broken Harbor, I knew all about the habitats of stilts, weasels, polecats. I know weird things for, for these books. Um, the police stuff, up until The Searcher, I was really lucky because I know through one of those sets of third hand connections that you do get in Ireland, I know a retired detective. Um, his brother went to drama school with my husband, so that, you know, and he's been incredibly generous with his time and his knowledge over the past 15 years or whatever. Like he has not only answered my questions, which are a ridiculously wide variety of questions that you have in something like this, but he tells me stories. And that's what you need if you're going to write anything in a world that you don't really know. You don't always know the questions that you need to ask. You don't always know what it is that you need to know. So having somebody who, rather than just answering your specific questions, which might not be the right ones, will talk to you, tell you stories, makes a huge difference. That's where you get a sense of the world and a sense of the dynamics within it and a sense of the atmosphere, is from someone who will tell you stories. So he was on the Irish Garda Shikana, the Irish police force. So it made less of a difference um, for the searcher, where Cal was a retired Chicago detective. But in this case, he wasn't actually functioning as a detective in the book. So I didn't need quite as much research. On the contrary, he had very deliberately rejected everything that goes with being a detective. And he was stripped of all the, the weaponry of a detective, both literally and metaphorically. He can't you know, phone up the technical bureau and ask them to track down the suspect's mobile phone contacts or anything like that. He's got none of that. So the only thing he's got left of being a detective is whatever skill is within his own mind. So I didn't really have to do as much research into, you know, what technical assets the Chicago Police Department has or anything like that. I didn't need that kind of detail this time. Next question, a uh, lady says, I saw Gabriel Byrne at Live Talks Los Angeles and he talked about, he, was, he appeared to talk about his memoir. She says he talked about acting and writing. Uh, I'm curious how your background in theater has influenced your writing. <laughs> well, it's, it's really good training is all I can say because I, I was never wildly successful but I did a fair number of theater shows in Dublin and it's the same thing at bottom, especially if you write first person, which I mostly have. Your, your job is, and God knows, Jamie knows a hundred times more about this than I do, so I feel like an idiot saying it's around you, around someone who is at the top of this craft, but tell me if I say anything stupid. Your job is to make this character so real and so transparent that your audience feels like they're intimately connected to them and know them inside out and see the world through their lens. Have I said anything stupid yet? No. Okay. It's as simple as that. 
Yeah, and it's the same thing in writing. It's to make the character real and then let the audience into them right to the heart. So it's it's pretty good training because it's the same the same thing deep down. Please tell me I didn't say anything stupid right there. <laughs> Next question says, um, I read somewhere that you were influenced at a very early age by Stephen King. Uh, and also he ended uh, reviewing one of your books. Uh, could you tell me about the influence and what it felt like to be reviewed by Stephen King? Well, I'm still picking my jaw up off the floor is what I'm doing about Stephen King. <laughs> because yeah, I read it when I was uh, what, 14, 15. And I'm easily freaked out, right? Especially by the eerie. Not so much by horror and gore, but eerie stuff freaks me right out. And even though I read it, making sure it was like a chapter or two a day and not too close to bedtime, I had nightmares for weeks. And it wasn't any of the gore that did it. It was the, the bit where the kids, um, their memories keep somehow being excised from their minds and they try to hold on to them. This is the kids when they've grown up. They're trying to hold on to them. They're finding different techniques to try to hold on to these memories and they keep being ripped away. And this idea of your mind as not being inviolate, not being entirely yours, being uh, something that can be invaded and altered by outside forces, that freaked the living hell out of me. And I only realized years later that in retrospect, that is, of course, deeply seated in, in the woods where the protagonist runs mm -hmm. into a woods to play with his two friends when they're 12. And he's the only one who comes out and has absolutely no memory of what happened to the other two. And that grows to be the great horror of his life is the fact that he there is something inside his mind that he can't touch. And, you know, looking back at it, of course that comes from it, but I didn't realize at the time. So, yeah, Stephen King is to blame for all of this, all of it. And uh, two more questions. Uh, one says, the Irish and storytelling, you are so good. Where does that come from? The Irish and storytelling. Um, That's a good title in its own. The Irish and storytelling. The Irish and storytelling, and a really good question. My first inclination is to say that I think um, language has huge power in Ireland because of the cultural historical background, where for a long time, when Ireland was colonized by Britain, you know, Irish was illegal to speak. You weren't allowed to speak Irish. You weren't supposed to do this. So the act of speaking, the act of putting a story into words, was in itself an act of rebellion and risk and danger and power. And that gives it a charge of enormous power that, that I think still holds, still has resonances down today, where when you tell a story, when you sing a song, you pass something on, you're doing something that has power and we still feel that way a little bit. And that language in itself is something that deserves to be celebrated and honored because there's a sense that it's something that can be taken away, that people have tried to take away from the Irish before. And so that value is still set on it to a large extent. I hope that never goes. I hope that doesn't get eroded. And our final question, um, does the dark material you write about ever haunt you? Also a really good question. I think it's kind of the other way around. Crime writers in my experience are like, not the haunted, dark, intense types that you would think at all, because you know, anything dark and intense goes into our heads, we get to write it down and if we're lucky, we can get paid for it. This is great. But I think it's more that the reason I write mystery books is because I've always been really interested in mystery. And this is a way of exploring it. This is a way of trying to come to an understanding of how people can end up doing terrible things to each other. I think that's why people read crime a lot of the time as well, is it's not people who are so much haunted by dark things, but people who really want to understand, not necessarily how supervillains are formed or how somebody, like how a psychopath can do terrible things, but how someone who starts as a normal human being trying to do their best can wind up doing something terrible. And that is a frightening thing. And both crime writing and crime reading, I think, are ways to try and understand it a little better, try and find some clarity there. So it's, I don't think it's really that it haunts me. I think it's a process more 
of trying to understand that so that it doesn't haunt me, if that makes any sense. Maybe. Well, we'll have to find out when we read the sequel. Is that your next book? Is the sequel to The Searcher? Oh yes. my God, I'm so happy. You have no idea. If you have I, am, coffee. I am so happy. Everyone on this is so darn <laughs> happy right now. I did not know that before we began. And that is the Christmas present I didn't think I wanted. Um, I am delighted to have been here with you. I think you're fantastic and a, a great writer and storyteller and woman. And it's awesome. And I just think you're a wonderful person. Thank you for doing this with us. Thanks, Ted, for uh, organizing this. And I look forward to meeting you sometime in person. Um, and uh, until then, I am really excited to, uh, to read the sequel, um, which I will be very excited to get. Um, maybe Thank I'll you so much. A galley. Just... Maybe I'll get a galley. Who knows, people? Maybe, yeah. Maybe yeah. I'll get a galley. The first dance. And thank you so much. for Because you were someone I've been wanting to thank for like a long time, since I was a teenager. So to get the opportunity is absolutely amazing. And thank you, not just for this, but for many things across many years. And thank you so much to Ted for having me this, this and to everybody who's watching and reading. Yeah. Thank you. Watching and reading, yeah. watching and reading, and waiting, waiting for the sequel. Um, God bless like everyone. Take care. Thank you very much, Jamie, for coming back to our series on Come screen, on. hopefully in person soon again. And thank you, Tana. Thanks to those of you who sent in terrific questions. Thank you. Tana French novel again is The Searcher and is available wherever books are sold. And books with signed book plates can be purchased in the link below. As we like to say around here, go on gently. <laughs>